everybody. How y'all doing today? In case we haven't met, uh, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Let me start with a question. You know, why are you here today? What made you all show up for service today? You know, for the first time, um, you know, I know why I'm here, I guess I would say. I'm here to tell you a story, right? And um, it's a story that for the first 22 years of my life, I don't know that I believed. It's a story that on the surface seems so outrageous that it would be hard to believe some of the claims that I'm going to share with you today. It's not a story about the Easter Bunny. It's not a story about egg hunts. And it reminded me of the first time that I showed up in church. So for the first 22 years of my life, I never showed up at church. It wasn't something that Mary Jo or I really did. Um, But at the invitation of her mother that day, we ended up showing up to church. But let me tell you something. Um, We didn't show up to her mom's church. So this is to give you a little bit of history about what I was like at that particular stage of my life. So her mom invites us to church. So we're kind of evil. So instead of going to her mom's church, we go to another church, right? Now, remind you, I've never been to church, right? Like, we've never been to church. So we did it to kind of spite her. So I ask you, why are you here today? Maybe somebody drug you here today. Maybe you're here today because you're avoiding some other family members who are going to another church. I don't know why you're here today. But I'm here to tell you a story. I'm here to tell you a story that's worth remembering. I'm here to tell you a story that is worth sharing and retelling over and over and over again. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory today. You are our God and King. We came here to worship you, to exalt the name of the risen Lord, the one who rose from the dead. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Let me ask you a couple more questions. How many of you enjoy going to the movies or did maybe enjoy going to the movies back in the day? Anybody like that? Only, only a few of you, huh? There's uh, Others of you all got issues. You didn't like going to the movies and stuff like that. Okay, I get this. Well, you know, maybe prior to COVID, it was an experience that Mary Jo and I loved. In fact, our very first date, we went to the movies, you know, back many, many, many years ago. And um, it's been a tradition that we had for a long time, and I loved everything about it. I loved the, the popcorn smell when you would walk in there. I loved eating candy. I loved the oversized giant sodas that were like this big, none of which are very good for you, by the way, right? But over the last two years, I've kind of lost interest, obviously. They closed down the theaters, and we haven't really even gone. I think I've gone two times in the past two years But when it pertains to movies or TV shows, are you the kind of person that likes to watch one over and over again, or are you like the one and done? How many of you are the over and over again camp, right? One and done. I'm definitely one and done. I can't watch him. Like Mary Jo, now The Notebook, 50 times. I don't know how. 50 times she's probably watched that show. She still has it on the VCR and still watches it on the VCR. I don't know. Some of you don't even know what a VCR is, right? But she still has the VCR version of that, right? How about one more, and then I'll get into the heart of the message. Are you the kind of person that remembers movie scenes and actors and actresses, or are you the kind of person that can't name them for the life of you? How many of you can actually remember the scenes, remember the actors? I hate you people. There's something (laughs) wrong with you. I can't believe you. I can't remember one for the life of me, but I can tell you the story that I'm about to share with you today is one that is definitely worth remembering. It's definitely worth telling over and over again. In fact, when I look at the heart of most stories and most movies and most um, TV shows that really have meaning and significance, most of them get them by stealing some elements of the story that I'm about to tell you today. Almost all of them go back to the story. In fact, when you look at history, right? How many of you studied history when you were in school? Anybody remember history before they started rewriting it? Come on, Jesus, right? It's really his story, right? It's his story, and that's the one that I want to tell you today. I want to talk to you about the gospel. There's an Old Testament set of verses found in Deuteronomy that have always been very important to me. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What God was saying to them is this story that he's telling them is so important that you should never forget it. And let me tell you, the devil wants to do all he can to get you to forget it, right? That's why he wants to teach us about Easter bunnies and Easter egg hunts and make those kinds of things more important. Or when it comes to Christmas, he wants to make it all about Santa, right? He wants to deflect from the real meaning of the days that we're celebrating. We're not here to celebrate Easter. We're here to celebrate Resurrection Sunday, the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There's no greater story. And let me tell you something, it's continuing to be written through the hearts and minds of all the believers in this room and the ones that are in rooms like this all around the globe today, Acts 29 is being written before us, right? You are Acts 29. The story is being written through you. But let's go back to the very beginning, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It says, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first thing that we need to understand about this story is it's a story about God. It's not a story about us. But in life, we tend to make it all about us, right? It's about me, myself, and I. No, it's about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what this story is about. It's about the one who slung the stars into the sky, you know, this morning, Mary Jo and I were driving in, we pull out, we get onto the street, and uh, just, it couldn't be more picturesque. The, the clouds are busting through, and you see the different rays falling right through. That's not something you get to see every day, but it was almost like a perfect gift of Jesus saying, wow, this is my day, right? The sun shines through the clouds. He is the king of glory. He is the one that we sung about earlier this morning and will continue to sing about for all eternally, eternity. Genesis 126. Then God said, we read this one last week, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. This is how the story begins. It's almost seemingly outrageous. Darwin would have you believe, poof, we somehow came out of the cosmic muck and everything came to be. But the Bible tells us that we have a first father and a first mother, Adam and Eve, who are part of our history. And there's some amazing and wonderful things about them. And there's some challenging things that they did. See, when the earth was formed and they first began to walk on it, all seemed to be at peace. Don't you wish it was that way right now, right? But what they couldn't see with their earthly eyes was the fact that there was this cosmic battle that was taking place in the heavens. Better than, better than anything Marvel could ever invent, right? There's this battle that was going on in supernatural places, and guess what? It was about to come onto earth, and it slithered into the garden in the form of a snake, and that snake could speak and that snake spoke to them and convinced our first father and our first mother that they should eat of this apple, this thing that God told them not to eat, right? And they partook in it. And in that moment, in that instant, everything began to change. Sin entered the world and we're still suffering the ramifications of it even in our own generation. Do you ever sense the weight of sin in the world today? Can anybody relate to me? If you're awake, if you're ready, if you're here, can you say amen? amen? Satan was leading this cosmic rebellion and he hatched his plan to destroy all humanity and bring glory to himself. But let me tell you, from the very beginning, God had a rescue plan. He was going to send his one and only begotten son to die in our place for our sins so that we might have life. How many of you are glad that he had a rescue plan? See, the story that I'm telling you about today from Genesis to Revelation is a story whose main character is none other than Jesus Christ. He is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. 
but it's not a story that is always blissful and always good and everything is wonderful. When you flip those pages, there's a lot of sin and pain and death and the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, right? And there's this very short sentence in Genesis 3.21. It says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. In our generation, we don't think much about it. We go to Walmart and we get our clothes, right? We go to wherever we go and we find our clothes and it seems like nothing. But in that moment, for the first time, death had entered the earth. Something had to die to cover up their sin. The wages of sin is death. And from that moment forward, pain would be here, but there's also a promise of the end of the pain in the form of none other than Jesus Christ. There came a day in the book of Exodus, it says, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. The children of Israel groaned because of their bondage and they cried out and their cry came to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and it says that God acknowledged them. Or in other versions of that same set of scriptures, it said God heard their cry. I asked you earlier, what brought you here today? You know, I think back to that faded April of 2000 two for Mary Jo and I, or 1992, actually, man, I'm getting old. Come on, Jesus. 30 years ago. I don't know why we received the invitation. Maybe it was her mom was annoying us and we just started to show up to church. I don't know. How many of you have friends that annoyed you into church? Come on, Jesus. Thank you for those friends now at this stage of our lives, right? But there was a lot going on in my life. There was addiction, there was pain, there was fatherlessness. There was a young couple who got married at age 18 who had two children at that particular point. We're trying to figure out how to live. We showed up in church that Sunday and it began a journey for us. Yes, we did not go back to church with her mom immediately, but her mom continued to be persistent and invited us. And on Mother's Day of that year, we ended up showing up to church where her mom was at. And a few short weeks later, we ended up surrendering our life to Jesus. And from that moment forward, for the past 30 years, we've lived for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And maybe I walked in there to fulfill an obligation, but I walked in there and I heard a story that would ultimately change my life. And maybe it's the same thing For some of you who are here today, you came in and maybe you're crying out in some way and you're like, man, I really need to encounter this Jesus that Eric's talking about up there today. I pray that you meet him in this place this very day. God heard their cry and he initiated a rescue plan that would culminate in the sacrifice of what we now call the Passover, right? If you're familiar with the story, They would have to sacrifice a lamb for a house, a perfect unblemished lamb for a house. If they would apply its blood to the doorposts and lentils of their house, the angel of death would pass over them and it did and it happened and it's yet what seemingly is another outrageous story but a story that we know to be true a story that effectively led them out of Egypt and sent them onto the promised land, but also was a type and shadow of what was to come, of God's ultimate rescue plan and sending his one and only begotten son, the sinless, spotless, perfect lamb of God to be slain once and for all time for your sins and for mine, that we could live and be a part of the family of God forevermore. Can I get an amen from all the believers in the room? It was a story that God told them to tell over and over and over again. In Exodus 12, it says, So this day to you shall be a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast, an everlasting ordinance. And Jews to this day, we're celebrating it this very week, this very time where at the end of the Passover, the whole Easter story, the whole Resurrection Sunday story begins. But before we go there, let me tell you one or two more aspects of the story. Let's begin to connect the Old Testament and the new, John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Do you see the connection with the Passover? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus, some 2,000 years ago, was born of a virgin named Mary. You know that part of the story, right? 
If not, show up for Christmas this year. I assure you, we will be telling that part of the story that night. Born of a virgin. This story is just getting crazier and crazier, is it not? Born of a virgin, how does that happen? But by the power of the Holy Spirit, he lived a sinless, spotless, perfect life. How many of you have been able to do that? You better not raise your hands. None of us is capable of doing that, but Jesus did it in your place for your sins that you might have life. There came a moment where Jesus posed a question to Peter. It's found in Matthew 16, 15, and he asked him a simple question. Who do you say that I am? You know, there's no more important question in life I started telling you the story. Maybe you've heard it a thousand times, but have you ever answered that question? Who do you say he is? Who is Jesus? Was he a prophet? Was he a good man? Was he a lunatic? Was he a liar? Or was he Lord? Every one of us has to answer that question. The Bible says that One day, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's the most important question of all time. Life and death, heaven and hell, literally lie in the balance with the answer to that question. Do you believe the story that I'm telling you? How many of you believe the story that I'm telling you today? Do you believe this story? See, there's this bumper sticker verse. John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. You know, as believers, there's moments where maybe we even question what we believe. We question aspects of this story. And let me tell you something. You're not alone in that. There was a time and a moment in John the Baptist's life, even after he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all the world, he asked through a messenger to Jesus, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things that you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Let me tell you something, Jesus is the one. He is the king of kings. He is the king of glory. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one worthy of honor, glory, and praise. May we continue to praise him even right now. Give God a little bit of glory in this place if you would. The Bible tells of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We celebrated that last weekend. He was celebrated with shouts of Hosanna and the highest glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that week was an incredibly important one, that holy week. He, he did things like flip over the tables at the temple that week, right? He went and he talked of his death, burial, and resurrection, and some of them weren't ready to receive it at that particular moment, right? But ultimately, he would find himself at a place where he would be betrayed by those that he loved. He would find himself in Gethsemane, right? The place of the skull. The believers that were around him at that particular moment, they would fall asleep. Let me tell you something. We can't be asleep in our generation. There's too much work to do. We need to be wide awake. We need to be about the kingdom and the king's business. And he finds himself there that night. The weight of the world is resting on his shoulders and the Bible tells us that it is so stressful to him that he begins to actually sweat drops of blood. Why did he do that? Because he loved you and I and he could sense the weight of what was going on in that particular moment. He's betrayed and the Roman guards along with the Jewish leaders of that day take him and they begin to try him and they put him on a false trial and they lie about him. And then there's this very gruesome scene that takes place that none of us really want to gaze at, the fact that they beat him to a pulp so much so that he's unrecognizable. They pull his beard from his very face. 
They whip him and scourge him, and ultimately, he willingly lays down his life. He could have called down legions of angels to come rescue him, but he knew the importance of that particular moment, so he lets his arms go out wide, and he lets them nail him to a cross. He lets them raise him up. He would die an earthly death, right? But just before he would die, he would say these words, it is finished. Or better translated, paid in full. Your debt, my debt, paid in full. Anybody glad? Anybody glad, right? As he would die, the temple veil would be rent in two from top to bottom. You and I gaining access to the holy of holies, hallelujah. Is that song we sang a little bit earlier, the earth would go dark. And boy, did things look gloomy for those believers on that Saturday, did it not? He's in the grave, what happened? All this stuff we've been learning, all the stuff that we've seen, are these stories not true? (laughs) What's going on? I know I witnessed them with my eyes. I thought the king was here. I thought my savior was here and now he's gone. They go and they begin to make the burial preparations and then some ladies show up at the tomb and guess what? The stone was rolled away. What is going on here? And the angels declare as Adam read earlier, guess what? Who are you looking for? Why are you here? What did you show up for today? Guess what? He's not here. He is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead. Not only that, you go from that moment and many see him walking and talking to them after he had risen from the dead. How crazy is this? It's a story that God can only impress on our hearts. It's a story that requires some measure of faith in our generation, but look to your right and look to your left because look at all the changed lives that we've already witnessed in our own generation and all those who have gone before us as they've shared this glorious story of the king of kings who would come and die in our place for our sins that we might have life. This is an amazing story and it is a true story. So let me ask you again, who do you say that he is? Why did you come here today? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Lord, I am so grateful that this story came alive and became true to me on May 31st of 1992. Maybe that would have never happened unless somebody had invited us to Easter service that particular weekend where our spiritual journey began, where I first heard the story in a real way that wasn't the Easter bunny, it wasn't any longer about going on egg hunts on that day, but I heard the true story of how you sent your son from heaven to earth to show us the way, about how me, a fatherless kid, had a heavenly father who loved me enough that he would have a rescue plan in place to bring me into his family. Lord, I am grateful for having heard that story, but I am ever more grateful for saying, Lord, I believe, I believe you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that I might have life ever so deeply within me. Lord, I will love you with all my heart, strength, soul, and mind for all my days until I get to embrace you in eternity. Lord, that's been my story for 30 years and I pray that some in this room's journey would begin this very day that, Lord, they came here for whatever reason, maybe even just to appease family, but they will leave here changed. They will leave here different. This story will come alive for them for the very first time. So I would ask you today, 
Who do you say that he is? And I would pray that your decision is that, yes, he is the son of God. And if it is, and you've never prayed the kind of prayer that I just prayed, saying that Jesus is the son of God, I'm telling you, do it now. Do it now. Your life will never be the same. God will enter your heart. It will be different. You will be forgiven. You will be set free. You will be sent into an eternity in God's family. You will no longer taste death. Hallelujah. So if today's a day that you need to dedicate or maybe rededicate your life to God, I would love to have the opportunity to pray with you with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Would you do me just one favor? If that's you, would you raise your hand up high so I could see it right where you're at? If that's you today, would you do that right now? I see your hand in the back. Thank you, Lord. Are there others who are here today? Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. Is there anybody else that I'm missing? If it is, raise your hand up just a little bit higher. I'd love to pray for you right where you're at. I see your hand and yours. Thank you, Father. Thank you for moving on their hearts today. Here's what I want to encourage you. After I pray up here at the front, if you raised your hand, would you come up to the front? We'd like to give you some information to help you start this way of life off in a great way. Maybe you'd also like to come up and get prayer. Our prayer team is up here at the end of the service every single week. They would love to join hands with you and pray and intercede over whatever's going on in your life. They're here for you. That's what the body of Christ does. We love one another. We care for one another. We're there for one another and we'll pray for you. So Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity once again to tell and retell the story of this king who came from heaven to earth to show us the way. Jesus, we fully believe with all our heart that you are the king of glory, that you are the savior of the world. And Father, we can't thank you enough for sending him here to save us. Thank you that your rescue plan is taking full effect, that even in our generation, you're still saving, you're still delivering, you're still healing, you're still setting free. And Father, we thank you in this very moment that people are still raising their hand and saying, I do, I believe that you are the king of kings and Lord of lords, and I will commit my life to you this very moment. Will you, by the power of your blood, wash my sins away as far as the east is from the west, Lord God? I welcome and am glad to become a part of your family today, Lord Jesus, and I will spend the rest of my life telling and retelling the story of how you saved me, how you you love me, how you came to set me free. Oh, Lord, we can't thank you enough. If you are a believer in this room. Give God a little bit of glory right now, this very moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving us. Father, this is the only story we're telling and retelling. And Lord, would you continue to impress it on our hearts as believers in Jesus Christ, that we would go tell the world about what you have done that we would truly get to realize our dream of seeing our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you glory. Amen, amen, amen. Give Jesus one more big round of applause. He is worthy. He is deserving of all praise.